Welcome to worship on All Saints Day. Today, we saints on earth join with the saints in heaven to sing praises around God's throne. Today is Blanket Sunday. If you would like to contribute, um, put it in the offering plate, and in our children's sermon, we'll do a Blanket Sunday. Some other highlights are Presbyterian women will meet on November 5th, and Christy O'Mara will be the featured speaker. We will have a congregational meeting while in worship on November the 8th to vote on the new deacons. Uh, we will be honoring our 50 year members on November the 15th. Um, a thank you is written from Mickey Huntley in the bulletin. And are there any other announcements? Okay, for to honor our November birthdays, Jill is going to play happy birthday. So let's sing happy birthday to November birthday. For the life of the world. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was born of a Virgin Mary, who, by his cross and suffering, redeemed the world and has washed us of our sins, who on the third day rose from the dead and has given us the victory, who ascended on high and intercedes for us at the right hand of God. For the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, for the great cloud of witnesses unto which we are baptized. Thanks be to God. For all holy men and women, our mothers and fathers in faith, for the noble bands of the prophets, for the glorious company of the apostles, for the white robes of armies of martyrs, for the cherubims and sacrifices, Michael and the holy angel. Be, be gracious to us, deliver your people. Hear us, God. Give new life to your servants by the grace of baptism. Strengthen all who bear the signs of the cross. Clothe us in compassion and love. Bring us with all your saints to the river of life. Hear us, O God. God of all the faithful, we rejoice that nothing in all creations can separate us from your love. Work out your good purpose in us and help us in our weakness as we await with eager longing the redemption of all things through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Come, join with me in standing as you are able and singing together our hymn of praise, Though I May Speak, number 335 in the blue hymnal. <laughs>
Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Eternal God, in every age you have raised up men and women to live and die We confess that we are indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name, but we are silent. We call us to do what is just, but we remain mild. You call us to live faithfully, but that we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow your way that joining with those from ages past who have served you with faith, hope, and love, and we may inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ. Lord God, hear us now as we confess our sin before you. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they receive mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you, Jill. Where's my? There it is.
very good morning to you all. Uh, I have a follow-up from uh, last week. Uh, I thanked Vicky for her work on the fall harvest decorations and acknowledged Linda and Don Anthony as well for the contribution of the, of the shucks, the corn stalks. And uh, Vicki informed me that I also needed to acknowledge Andrea for the donation of the gourd. So thank you, Andrea. And um, not that anyone's here, but it doesn't hurt to know. We need to acknowledge that Plum Creek gave us the pumpkins for free. So thank you to Plum Creek for their contribution. Also, of course, thank you, Jill, for your leadership this morning with your uh, organ playing. And Andrea, thank you for your leadership this morning as well. Two readings for you today, as is the usual. Old Testament reading today came. <clears throat> the Old Testament reading today comes from the prophet Amos, fifth chapter, verses fourteen to fifteen. Amos five fourteen and fifteen. Let us all now listen for the word of the Lord. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so I am who I am. The God of hosts will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that I am who I am. The God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And our New Testament reading today, sermon text, comes from uh, the first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12 and 18 to 21. First John, chapter 4, 7, 12, and 18 to 21. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears <clears throat> has not been perfected in love. <clears throat> we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother or sister. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. And now, Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think that when most people hear the word love, they immediately go to their favorite Hollywood love story. Right? Maybe it's a standard Hollywood romance, like, well, from my generation anyway, sorry, I gotta you know, preach what you know. Um, uh, Sleepless in Seattle, or You've Got Mail, you know, Tom Hanks and Beg Ryan defined what a love story was for a lot of us. <laughs> Um, or it could be a romantic comedy where, again, my generation, anything from Julia Roberts was what we knew to be a romantic comedy, right? Um, 
let's see, these are typically stories about two people who are dealing with their own struggles, right? Their own troubles. They are usually depicted as self-destructive activities which have previously precluded them from being able to engage in a romance and have a connection, the most frequently portrayed of which is workaholism, right? But that special someone softens their hearts towards one another, causing them to reevaluate their self-destructive activities. I quit working so much. So that they can then declare their never-ending, undying love for one another and live happily ever after. Yes, sometimes there is a third person involved, like my best friend's wedding, but there is never adultery or anything else shameful, right? The right thing is done and everyone moves forward with their lives and we're still happy ever after and two people are in love. And Hollywood produces these movies because they sell. And because they sell, they make a lot of money. And they sell and make a lot of money because people eat this stuff up. This is the idealized version of adult relationships that people seem to want for themselves, irregardless of the reality or plausibility of such a thing actually happening. Romance novels have been popular for, uh, as a genre for I don't even know how long, <laughs> but a long time. Pornography, in which a twisted pay-for-play version of love is depicted, is a $1 billion industry. People consume these versions of love realize they don't have it in their own lives because they are not real. And people are bewildered as to why the divorce rates are so high as, as they are. My contention is to do at least in part to bad storytelling. Pop culture gives us a bad story. The love story that the Bible depicts on the other hand, differs drastically from what pop culture pumps out. The beginning of the story is not about a workaholic character who is lonely and just can't seem to find time to meet that special someone. No, in fact, if anything, from the beginning, the Bible reveals itself as a one-sided love story. And such a one as I've never seen in all of human literature. Out of an excess of love, God creates. Next chapter reveals that, in fact, God loves so much that God breathes a bit of God's self into the creation to give it life. God's very own breath is in the creation. Flipping back to the first chapter, God puts the kibosh on the whole workaholism thing by resting, by taking a Sabbath. Why is it one-sided? Well, flipping ahead to the third chapter, we don't know really how long it was just God and the created in relationship with one another, but sooner than later, the created rebel against God. They scorn God's love and choose not to return it, which is their right to choose, make no mistake, but such a choice is the beginning of a continued set of choices, which continue to further divide both humanity from God and humanity from humanity, from one another. Humanity enslaves other members of the human race, and God acts on behalf of those who were enslaved, not the slavers, not the oppressors. Of course, I'm referring to Exodus. As humanity, as humanity continues to divide itself in scorn of God's love and breath being granted to all humanity, we see the one-sided one -sided love story continue to take shape. The slaves are freed, but immediately, in their freedom, instead of returning God's love, they moan and groan for fear of dying of thirst and starvation. They look backwards in nostalgia instead of forward in hope, going so far as to suggest that it would have been better for them to have stayed slaves because at least then they would have been alive and could have filled their bellies with food. 
And of course, we as readers of this one-sided love story are left to ponder the unspoken question. Is one even alive at all if one is enslaved? God meets humanity's needs of food and water, and as God needs, uh, God needs to have a conversation with humanity's representative, Moses, up a mountain for several days, humanity down below getting impatient, and again, not returning God's love, convinces one of their own to build a false idol, a false image for them to love instead of God. Even as that generation suffers, God refuses to abandon or forsake humanity. God will try again with the next generation. The one-sided love story continues as God lovingly gives the next generation of humanity a place to live. And then again, they rebel. They don't trust God, or they don't want to look weird to their neighbors who all have a human king, and so rejecting God's love as king, humanity wants a human king. And from there, the one-sided love story's plot line becomes painfully repetitive. Human kings fail. Always. Because even when one does do better than another, <laughs> Loves God, compels the people to do the same, invites the people to do the same. He dies. And whoever follows may choose to undo what good was done. Boy King Josiah, just as an example. Humanity keeps not loving God, and God keeps loving humanity. This one-sided love story between God and humanity reaches its climax in one Jesus of Nazareth, the illegitimate son of a teenage girl and a carpenter from the flyover area of Israel, Nazareth. And Jesus spent his time in ministry declaring to anyone who would hear, yes, God loves you, even you. Not only that, But this one-sided love story does not have to be one-sided. You can love God back, Jesus tells us. How? By loving the rest of humanity. Huh. All of humanity is the incredulous response. Surely not the sinners and the defiled. If we associate with the defiled, we'll become defiled ourselves, and we certainly can't have that. To which Jesus responds, yes, even then, I associate with the defiled. And do I now seem defiled to you? Love God by loving those you hate. By loving those who persecute you. By loving people who steal from you by loving people who have needs and meeting those needs, giving them food and water and shelter. Love God by loving those who are forced to sell their bodies, by loving those who are in prison, by loving those who are in debt. Love God by loving your fellow human. Paul phrases it as, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Philippians 2, 3 and 4. And to Christianity's credit, after Jesus' ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit, Luke reports in Acts chapter 2 that things started out pretty well. Pretty well. Christians set their own ambitions aside, made resources available to any who had need. They shared all they had, and the Lord added to their number daily, is what Luke reports in, chapter, in uh, Acts 2. But soon enough, the love story started returning to the plot line of one-sidedness. 
of God's love for humanity, despite humanity's rebuffing of God's love, as selfishness, pride, arrogance, and whatever else precludes humanity from loving God, once again rose to the fore. Humanity stops loving God as they stop loving those they hate. Humanity stops loving God as they stop loving those who have needs and stop meeting those needs. Humanity stops loving God by loving those, by not loving those who are in debt, and the list goes on. Paul writes in his letter to Corinth that he hears that there is quarreling among them, and the quarrel is over whose teaching should be followed. 1 Corinthians 2. Paul's, or Apollos's, or Cephas's, Peter, or Christ's, and Paul is astounded, he's astonished. Christ, the climax of the love story, he tells them, is not divided. And the love story is only seen to get more and more one-sided from there. God continuing to love humanity, and humanity continuing to love God less and less as humanity continues to grow to hate one another more and more. How does love then tie into vulnerability as this has been our series, Emotions and Vulnerability? It is going to require humanity, all of us, to choose to be vulnerable with itself, with ourselves, honest with itself, honest with ourselves, as we, as humanity, goes inward to discover the source of, the reason for, the growing hatred. God is not the source, nor is God the reason for hatred, period. God has nothing to do with hatred. God is love. Hatred is solely a human endeavor. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that... God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother or sister whom he cannot see, I'm sorry, for he who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loved God, loves God, must also love his brother and sister. Amen. In response to God's word read and proclaimed, we have a special opportunity today to celebrate 
those of our forebears who have gone on, those who have gone on recently and have ended their race and have ended it well. <laughs> and so we take this opportunity to share one another's burden of loss. You do not suffer the burden alone. We are here. We abide with you. Please join with me in this litany for all saints day. Gracious God, you are to be praised for the men and women whose faithful witness to your love inspires each generation of your people. Let us clearly recognize what it means to be called the children of God, and may we know um, may we know oh that we are to be your saints. We bless you, O oh God, for their lives and love, and rejoice for them that death is past and pain ended, and that they are with you in the church triumphant. At this time, I will invite those. Uh, we're just going to go through our listing order. So if you are lighting the candle, um, I will uh, recognize the person for whom you are lighting the candle, and then if you are coming forward, I invite you to come forward and uh, light that candle. And then um, Lisa Peebles, as a representative from our faith team, will be lighting the candles for those who don't have someone in the congregation to do that for them. Let's get, just, okay, still time. I'm just gonna direct a little bit towards the candelabra. Okay. Roy A. Clark. Donald Lee Knapp, Jr. Mark McKee. Marion Catherine K. Dinger. Kathy Feltus, friend of the Dinger family. Merrill T. Hud Delap, brother of Maureen Delap. Jean Schmickley, sister in law of Marlene Delap. Kelly Messerschmidt. Son in law of Elsie Barrett.
Larry Lands, brother of Norman Lands. Dwayne Salisbury, brother of Carol Nelson. Bonnie Alexander, sister of Dick Sanderman. Jean Lundgren Wyant, cousin of Dale Eaton. this year, we will light one for all of us who have lost a loved one, who has dear affection and memory for a departed spouse, a departed grandparent, a departed friend, member. All of us have lost, and so we can empathize with one another. And for the other candle this year, we will light it for those who have succumbed to the COVID-19 pandemic. Those who have lost their lives. May God's grace and mercy be upon us all. I invite you to continue in your response to God's word read and proclaimed through the giving of your tithes and offering. During this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, we humbly ask that pledges and donations be dropped off in the indicated basket in the narthex, either prior to or after the worship service. <laughs> Let us pray. Thank you, God, for these gifts which we have received. Give us wisdom and discernment as best how to utilize them to the upbuilding of your kingdom. May your divine will be done and not our own. Amen.
difícil. Friends, this is the Lord's table. How could it be anyone but the Lord's? This is the manifestation. This is the culmination. This is the representation of what it is to love. Therefore, it is God's table. The Lord's table it is not anyone else's. It's not ours. It's not mine. This is the Lord's table. All those who call upon him for grace, for mercy, are welcome to it. That is love. All are welcome. Please join with me in uh, remaining seated and singing our communion hymn, number 505, Be Known to Us in Breaking Bread. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior, when he was eating with his disciples, he was at supper, and he took bread much like this. He held it out to them and he broke it for them. And in doing so, he proclaimed, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the meal, as they were reclining at the table, Jesus took the cup and poured it out. And in doing so, he declared to the disciples that this cup is the new covenant poured out for you in my blood. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that whenever we eat this bread, and drink this cup. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes again. In this season of COVID-19, we have procured a safer way to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so I invite you now to peel off the top section with a little bit of bread and we may all partake. The body of Christ, broken for you. Eat of it all. Now you may turn that handy contraption over and peel off the juice, and we will partake again together. The blood of Christ, shed for you. Drink of it, all of you.
follow up thanks to Lisa for assisting in the All Saints Day recognition and thanks to Elementary Logos for the communion bread. Let us pray. Lord God, we are eternally grateful to you for your love for us. We're sorry that it's so one-sided. May this meal be a reminder of your love for us, and as we take it together, may it be a reminder that we can and we must love one another. All these things we pray to you in the name of Jesus, who is the Messiah, and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I invite those of you who are able to please stand and join with me in singing our closing hymn number 526 for all the saints in the blue hymn. <laughs>
this annotation from the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you whole in everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom we glory forever and ever. Amen.